Welcome everyone today to this session for the Underserved Population Network webinar. We thank you for taking time out today. I'm Misty Kevich with the HHQI National Campaign. Also joining us today is Andrea Lefke, Misty Dyke, and Crystal Welsh from our team. So welcome. Um, I do have a few housekeeping um, points to make today. If you have Q&As, because this is going to be a little different than a lot of our calls, but we typically do put our Q&As either in the Q&A box um, or the chat box, and you can do that at any time during the presentation today. We are going to have um, a couple different speakers, and you can put your questions in as we go along, and we'll entertain those when we get to the Q&A section. We also will have one polling question today, so look for that and we'll, for your response. And we also have a couple of chat questions that we're going to be looking for some responses and integrate into our presentation and discussion today. Those were also sent to you in your reminder notice yesterday, but you'll see those come up a little bit later. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover today, and you're going to be very anxious to talk with um, our speakers and to ask some questions. The universal language of caregiving, and what we need to know now. Our keynote speaker today is going to be Kim Linder, who is a certified senior advisor, caregiver, coach, radio talk show host, and consultant. But we also have two guest speakers that are going to do some sharing about caregiving themselves from Deb Perrion and Karen Hankel. First, I'm going to start with a, a several slides about caregiving facts to start to lay a foundation so that we know where we are um, in, in discussing um, caregiving to give us a little bit of foundation. There's a lot of information in the slides as well as into the references that you can look up later, but I'm going to quickly go through those. There are more than 65 million people, which is about 29% of our U.S. population, that provide care for a chronically ill, disabled, or aged family member or friend during any year, and they spend an average of 20 hours a week providing care for their loved ones. Now, if we took the value of that free service where they're not getting paid for caring for their family members, that's almost $375 billion a year. That's almost twice as much that's actually spent on home care and nursing home care services combined. I thought that was astounding. Women, who typically are family caregivers, are two and a half times more likely than non-caregivers to live in poverty and five times more likely to receive SSI. And as we look and talk so much about the underserved populations for patients, we need to keep that in mind also of the caregivers. 47% of working caregivers indicate that the increase in caregiving expenses have caused them to use up all or most of their savings. 23% of family caregivers who care for loved ones for five years or more report that their health is either fair or poor. Nearly three quarters of family caregivers report not going to the doctor as often as they should, and 55% say they skip seeing the doctor appointments for themselves, putting the patient, their loved one, ahead of themselves. And 63% of caregivers report having poor eating habits, as well as 58% say worse exercise habits. So as caregivers, we tend to not take care of ourselves as much as we should uh, because we put the needs of our loved one first. And between 40 to 70% of family caregivers have clinically significant symptoms of depression, and approximately a quarter to a half of these caregivers meet the diagnostic criteria for major depression. Now, the next two slides are talking about a recent article, a research article that came out. Um, the reference for that is on the second slide. Uh, it talks about the majority of caregivers report psychological distress with really any diagnosis. 
But the key point in the article that I found is the second bullet here. It really is the need for assistance with ADLs and strong correlation with the caregiver burden. It isn't related to the diagnosis. It really is related to the needs for the ADLs. Um, and this is really different than a lot of our previous studies. It's, they have shown that uh, chronic diseases such as heart failure, care, cancer, or COPD was, is significant. But in this, it is really the amount of ADL assistance that is really creating the burden. Caregivers that perceive um, or have a lack of social support also have a higher burden of care. Um, and this is a great opportunity for home care to provide support and establish community supports after discharge. And there is the reference for that article. I thought it was very interesting. Now this uh, slide is a little busy. Um, it, it, you can look at it a little bit better at full view on your slides. And I've also on the slide put openplacement.com and it is hyperlinked in the handouts, which I forgot are mentioned on the up tab of HHQI, so you can download those. With this, when we talk about dementia, it is dementia and Alzheimer's, any type of diagnosis. And I'm going to kind of hit a couple of these points, starting at the head, working towards the shoulder. There are 17.5 billion hours of unpaid caregiving for Americans with Alzheimer's or um, any other dementia in 2012. 80% of the care is provided by unpaid caregivers. And there are also 15 million Americans providing that unpaid care for Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Now, if we skip down um, to the mouth and the neck and the rest of the body, it kind of looks like rainbows or arcs. And what this is, is talking about ADLs, assistance. The orange arcs are for caregivers with people with Alzheimer's or other dementias. The blue arcs are caregivers of other older people who provide help with ADL. So very similar populations, but the difference is having that dementia diagnosis. You can see with the ADL assistance of getting out of bed, dressing, toileting, and feeding, the significant differences related with that specific diagnosis. This is just a little plug. If you missed our last up or underserved population network call last or two weeks ago, A New Way of Understanding Dementia with Jane Marks, it was an excellent presentation. Wonderful for healthcare providers, wonderful for caregivers, family members, and lay people. There's a little bit about pathophysiology, but basically it is about communicating, understanding how the, what's going on in the mind of a person with a dementia and how to work with them. And there were some excellent pieces, and it is recorded, and there, the uh, reference is at the bottom of the slide. And now I'm going to be very pleased to introduce our main speaker today, Kim Linder, has been helping family caregivers for more than a decade to create balance in their lives as they face challenges and struggles with their caregiving roles. She's the founder and certified senior advisor of Senior Holistic Living. Additionally, Kim is the executive director of assisted living facilities in Florida. She's a caregiver coach a radio talk show host, as well as a consultant. Her expertise and deep concern for caregivers have inspired her to host the Caregiving Hour. It is a weekly radio show where she empowers listeners and provides them with resources, information, and guidance from a wide variety of guests. As a caregiver coach, Kim's in-depth personal and professional caregiving experiences help families from all over the United States deal effectively with their caregiving concerns and questions. Her resourcefulness, understanding of people, and a keen sense of humor provides caregivers the tools, guidance, and comfort that they need while on this caregiving journey. Kim has been an active member of the Better Living for Seniors for over 10 years and has included being the Vice President and Board Member. She's on the Florida Council on Aging, National Council on Aging, and a founding member of the Professional Speakers Bureau of Tampa. 
So with that, I am pleased to welcome Kim. Would you like to say hello to everybody? Hello, everyone. So nice to be here. Thank you so much, Misty, for inviting me. Wonderful. We're going to jump right into some great topics, and I'm, I, and I'm going to be doing some questions, and then Kim is going to respond. And do remember, you can put your questions into the chat or the Q&As, and we'll entertain those later. So let's get started. Caregivers are from every walk of life, family members, neighbors, or friends, and even paid caregivers. Caregivers many times have to juggle their caregiving responsibilities with their own lives, such as their own homes, families, jobs, etc. Life is stressful all by itself, but adding that caregiving role can place an additional stress on the caregiver. So Kim, can you provide some insight into the impact of caregiving on caregivers? Um, yes. You know, first of all, Misty, your slides were the perfect foundation for this presentation, and it really did list out the impact very clearly of the money that's being spent uh, universally, of the money that's being spent individually by family members who have to, you know, maybe they've saved for their retirement or for buying a new home or for their children's college education, all of a sudden someone in their family becomes more dependent on them and they're more in an active caregiving role. And that has to be an important family decision of where does that money go now? Does it go to the college for Johnny or does it really need to go for Sally or does it really need to go for mom who may need hip surgery and, and extra care? So it, it's, it's a very large issue, but it impacts us individually um, as, a, as, a, as a caregiving community. The other piece that I was listening to, and you know, you talked about the finances and the health and everyone's overall well-being where you're not really taking care of yourself, you're skipping doctor's appointments, and you know, I'm guilty of this as myself. As I took care of my in-laws, I was really not going to the doctor's appointments. I wasn't really exercising properly and I wasn't eating properly. Like I was your typical caregiver burnout person. And so I, I think that I can, you know, when I'm on the radio, I feel like I make this very relatable and I really emphasize that it is so important to create that balance. And, and that's really what, um, this is really my philosophy. But I want to talk to you about something else that has popped up that's really impacted the family caregiver. And that's the stress of them becoming like medical experts. You have family members who are now having to do injections. Um, understanding um, uh, maybe insulin, how to do insulin readings and, and how, to, how to apply that to someone in their family when maybe they're not comfortable doing that or understanding um, oxygen levels or, you know, all these other medical pieces that really are not in our, you know, our bag of tricks as being family members and being thrusted into this has really created another stressor for the family caregiver. So in overall, my insight is, yes, we've got to acknowledge that we are caregivers. Yes, we're daughters, we're mothers, we're friends, we're professional caregivers, we're executive directors, administrative of home care companies, but you know what, we're people. And we are caregivers and we do need to wear that hat when it's appropriate and at, at that time, it's also appropriate for us to take care of ourselves. Thanks, Kim. Um, absolutely. So. Now, let's talk about explaining the difference between family and professional caregivers and how sometimes we can be both simultaneously. Um, well, a family caregiver, in my eyes, is someone who is related to the person who needs the care um, in some way, shape, or form. Um, it, it certainly can be a daughter, a mother, a son, a grandson, a brother. Like I had a brother on the radio the other day because we wanted to honor the male caregivers um, and what they do for uh, family members. And so it's anyone. It could be a distant relative. It could be someone who was adopted or just kind of in, become a very close family, a friend who also has become like a family member. So to me, that's someone who kind of wears the family caregiver hat versus the professional that is someone who I look to um, as all of us on this webinar today. We're all professional caregivers. We have this um, commitment to 
really taking care of people who maybe are not related to us, but who we care about because that's our heart. That's our soul. That's our spirit. That's where we feel purposeful. And we give because this is just who we are, and we've decided to make a career out of it. So you're looking at doctors and nurses and people related and connected to home care and health care, but also in medical settings, in nurses, um, nurse practitioners, ARNPs, um, certainly physicians, they don't necessarily think of themselves as professional caregivers, but they are, they definitely are, and they have a lot of power in that. Um, we're also talking about geriatric care managers and, and elder law attorneys. So to me, there is a divided line, but the heart and the, the, the passion for how we act as caregivers, to me, is in, in total alignment and universal. Great. Now, we have a polling question for you, and Misty Dyke's going to be putting up a polling question for you to answer, and it's, a, it's about yourself. So do answer this. It'll just be up for a few 15 seconds, so please go ahead. And while you answer that, and we're going to come back and take a look at the answers in just a minute, I'm going to go ahead with our next question. There we go. Um, what are some of the issues and tips when we struggle in being a son or a daughter in the role of a, being a caregiver? Kim? Okay, I'm sorry. That's I was okay, no, I just... Your, I was trying to answer your question online. Okay, okay so sorry. So let's, no, that's okay. So what are the issues and tips where we're struggling being a son or daughter and the role of a caregiver? Um, well, the issues are, well, it could be different issues for a um, for son or daughter um, because they could have different types of relationships with the person who needs the care. Um, and, you know, maybe just just talking about a male caregiver, they may not be comfortable necessarily giving the hands-on care that a daughter may be for her mother where it's really not an issue, but for the son, that could be a little bit of an uncomfortableness. So I think that sometimes um, a son who has to take care of his mother may need to get some extra help in the home in order to just kind of take care of that more of that hands-on care. Is that what you're asking about? I am. Sorry about that. I'm. T yes, that is exactly it. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm on target with what you're you're asking. And then um, for the daughter, it could be same way as for her father. So it depends on the relationship they have and the comfort level that that is between the two of them because it is a partnering. Um, it is a giving and a receiving. Um, and then for tips, I just think that it's having that conversation. Um, you know, we talk so much about planning in the caregiver in the world of caregiving, and you know, having that conversation maybe before anything happens, any kind of crisis happens. We talk about having your um, legal documents in order. We talk about um, maybe where your burial plans are. But this is, you know, care plans can be before that happens. And I think having that conversation ahead of time could be a really um, informative and bringing awareness and a closeness to a family because now you're hearing what your care loved one, what they want versus you having to guess what they want. And so I think maybe having a list of questions of what kind of care you would want mom or dad or brother or sister um, as you are aging could be kind of a good way to have start having that conversation and really finding out what they, their desires are. And it also gives you an ability to have an open conversation where you can talk about what you're comfortable with and then what are the alternatives for the family. Wonderful. Um, and, and by the way, we put the polling question back up. I, I really had that held to not very long. And even, um, as Kim said, she didn't have time to get it done, and nor did I. So please go ahead and answer. And if you answered before, go ahead and answer again. So we'll just be able to pull that. We'll leave that up for almost a minute, and we'll come back um, and look at that. But that was an excellent response, Kim. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, the next question I have for you is distance caregiving is common today with children moving for jobs. Can you talk about the role and issues with distance caregiving? Yes. Uh, 
to me, distance, distance caregiving is definitely um, a majority of the majority is people living near each other or like within maybe two to four hours. But there are people who do live a long distance or they can't just, you know, even though they're two hours away, maybe their lifestyle is so busy or there's a relationship where there's a hiccup in it where there's just not a strong connection. So distance can mean so many things. But we'll talk about the physical distance in, in the caregiving role. And yes, it is to me, it is common because uh, people do um, have different lives and then they have different careers and different reasons of why they have to move away. And it brings on additional stress for everyone involved, for certainly the caregiver and then the person who is needing the care and the expectations. And this kind of goes back to the conversation, the, the, I guess the answer I gave before, we're having these conversations now is so great to at least start it um, because things do happen. Uh, you could hear from uh, someone from work who's got a situation where um, they have their, their coworkers, family member lives long distance and that's kind of a cue for you. Maybe you need to have that conversation with your family member. But whether you have a conversation or not, it brings additional stress because there's a lot of guilt involved in caregiving, no matter if you live next door with them or even long distance. It just seems to um, be prevalent through the caregiving um, role. And really what we need to do is kind of accept whatever guilt you feel and be able to try to move past it and say, you know what, I'm doing the best that I can and I'm going to show my love and my care the best way I can as often as I can. So I think that long distance caregiving can also give you some objectivity to what's happening. Um, it gives you certainly the ability to be involved in any level of range that you want to be. Sometimes long distance caregivers give financially or they say, you know, what sis, I'm just going to take care of the medical for you while you do the hands on or I can help with the interviewing of certain uh, home, care, home care companies, or I can do the research online for you. So there's a lot that distance caregiving caregivers can do so that they can still feel involved. Does that answer your question? It, it does. And I also think, too, for those that are in the home health environment that are on the call, it is also a great opportunity for us to leverage those people we don't see as caregivers because they're never a around, but they could help with, as we talk a little bit later, and today we're going to talk about hospitalizations and ED visits. And so I think we could help leverage them and get them on board with our, our plan of care, and they can be active in what capacity that they can. So excellent. Thank you very much. Um, before welcome, we move Missy. to and I, I and I think what you just said, I'm so sorry, I, I just jumped on you, but I just love what you just said because it really does um, bring in that holistic approach that I talk about, about really it's not just the person who's sitting in front of you, the senior or elderly person, but it really is the family because they have different perspectives that can really give you some great insight into the person you're going to be caring for. And the more communication, the better. Perfect, perfect. And then let's just go back to the poll and, and have you, uh, um, sorry, have you as a healthcare worker had to also take on the caregiver role? And uh, we had almost 38% said yes currently, and I have to add myself to that. And right. um, previously, uh, we have uh, about 12, 13%, and probably in the near future, four, and I'm sure, um, and that we all will find ourselves in some role, but there are many of us that are already in this role right this very minute. Okay, so in home health, let's continue along that lines a little bit. We utilize telehealth to assist with monitoring vital signs, weights, labs, signs and symptoms. Kim, are you starting to see an increase in using technology in caregiving? Yes, and I think it's a great tool, and I think it's helping us move into the next century. I was um, recently asked to go to USF, the College of Nursing, because there is actually a wonderful um, woman there who is working with USF, who's created a device that will be in, that can be in someone's home to actually monitor sleep uh, patterns. So that if you're a caregiver and you have taken care of someone who 
is um, gets up in the middle of the night, instead of you jumping up in the middle of the night, it actually through sensors, not they no one has to wear any kind of device, but the sensors that you set up in strategically in your home are able to pick up when someone goes gets up, gets goes to the bathroom and comes back. If they don't come back after a certain time, then that alarms the caregiver that they need to get up. But otherwise, the caregiver is able to get additional rest. And that's one of the problems that caregivers lack. And I know that I was also one of them. I just wasn't sleeping well enough. And when you have lack of sleep, that, that affects everything. It affects my not being able to eat well, um, exercise and think well, and we always want to be making the wisest decisions for our loved ones and ourselves and maybe even other family members. So to me, I think technology is essential, and it's exciting to see that there are people out there creating those devices to make it a better journey for the person receiving the care and for the, for the person um, giving the care. Excellent. And, and we continue to also see the technology changing constantly. Um, there's even devices now in a study going on to determine when patients are, are falling and figuring out what activities they're doing by monitoring what they're, you know, their activities that they're doing to try to help us as caregivers and healthcare workers in minimizing those risks and, and med compliance or adherence. And there's just so much with the technologies. And we have that baby boomer generation. So it's not, I mean, I know my mother is 74 and she's very computer savvy and, um, you know, would welcome a lot of the telehealth type features. It's not for everyone. But it's there, and we're going to see them more need and advantages for that. I agree. So let's move on to another topic that's very interesting. Um, can you explain about holistic support and why it's important for caregivers? OK, I'm going to um, talk about what is holistic, because I did mention it before. And to me, it's the whole person. It's the whole person concept. It's the whole person. It's the patient that you're visiting in someone's home, at a hospital, in an assisted living, in a rehab, in a facility center setting, um, or it's even a family caregiver. So it's, it's looking at the patient, looking at the family member, and who are they holistically? Not just because um, people will come in, when I worked in assisted living, people would come in and say, oh, my mom is confused, she doesn't remember to take her medications. Well, that's not the whole picture of your mother. Maybe your mother, um, you know, we got to dig deeper to what, not just who your mother is, but also what is her life like that may be also affecting her, her brain functioning. But what I'm trying to say is that we want to be looking at someone, their emotional um, part of them, their psychological, their spiritual, their intellectual, their medical. Like you want to look at per people as a whole, just like you want to be seen as a whole, so do these patients that need care in the home. And so to me, it's really if you understand, if you do your discovery where it's more of a holistic approach, uh, getting deeper and digging maybe wider into why someone is needing care at, or what excites them, what motivates them, what makes them feel purposeful, I think we will be more successful in our journey as, as caregivers. Um, whether we're professional family caregivers. And I think by seeing someone as a whole person rather than just this one small segment of mom is just getting confused about her medication or mom is, is depressed, it's just limiting. And I want to always be thinking expansively and abundantly. And I think if we come in with that attitude, we end up really engaging that person who needs the care on all different levels and making them feel seen and heard and really feeling a, still a sense of purpose at any age. So to me, um, that is so important. And the support, once you understand, get a really clear understanding about what someone needs and wants, you're able then to support them, bring in those resources that are at your fingertips, um, that maybe you have a directory, maybe you have websites, maybe you have a book that you could bring in and offer additional support. Maybe, maybe a caregiver or maybe, a, 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 maybe you're visiting a couple and the, per, the wife needs the care but the husband is now the direct caregiver. Maybe there's some support that you're able to help 
him with as well. So it's looking at what his what his needs are as well. So I know that we come into someone's home and we want to assess what that that person, that elderly person needs and wants, but it would just take another five minutes really to understand what that caregiver wants and needs so that this can be successful for everyone involved, which would to me be that holistic support. Wonderful. I have great advice and, and for us to think as we do provide that holistic health care to the patients. Thank you. Okay, so now let's kind of talk about what we can in home health do better and how we can collaborate better. So when home health clinicians visit, Kim, it's typically about 45 minutes or so. We tend to focus on the patient's needs and concerns, and you know what? We may overlook the needs and issues of a caregiver um, who's really going to be supporting that patient for the periods of time and even 24 hours a day. Uh, what are some of the top issues and barriers a caregiver may have that we as providers might miss? Um, this kind of is a perfect link to what we just talked about um, with the holistic support. And turning, you know, a caregiver is not expecting a professional caregiver to turn around and say, so, Mr. Jones, tell me, how are you doing? They'll be surprised. So e that's even just a nice thing of just being noticed that, you know, it's not all just about your wife, which, who he may direct everything to, but it's really nice if we as professional caregivers can say, you know, Mr. Jones, we're so happy to be here with your wife and seeing her needs, but I'm just wondering, what do you need? Do you need a good night's sleep? Like if you do a little more inquiry, you might actually able to provide more services for them and um, reveal that just because you're going to be now having this dialogue with the caregiver. Maybe this person has not been sleeping. Maybe they haven't been eating well. Maybe they um, need additional respite where they maybe, – maybe there's an event going on, a graduation or a wedding that they would like to go to, but you would never know if you just go in and talk to the person who you've been assigned to care for. You really, you really will be making a difference if you take that time to turn around and just look at them and ask them, how can I help you? We do things differently as a home care company. Of course, we want to take care of your wife, Mr. Jones, but you know what? We think about how can we take care of you too? And if they refuse, then I think that's okay because at least you've started the dialogue because the next time someone comes in or follows up with them, I think you'll have built that bridge already because then they'll know you really are serious and sincere when you're asking that question. So I think what I'm saying to you is we need to come up with specific questions that you can use when you're doing your assessment. Add on doing your discovery for the caregiver. It will end up building that relationship with that caregiver so that if there's a bump if a caregiver doesn't show up or it's not the right caregiver who they thought was going to come, will be much less of a bump because you already have that relationship with them as well as their care, the person they're caring for. So I hope I'm making that clear, that it's essential for you to build a relationship with the caregiver, but not just only through who they care for, but who they are. And whether that's long distance or short distance, it really doesn't matter. It's about you taking that extra time and that extra step because you are a professional and you are committed to what you're doing and you want to stand out as a home care company and show them that you really do care about the whole picture. Oh, that's excellent. And we can tie those same points in just even looking at patient satisfaction and caregiver satisfaction um, in home health, too, for our providers. Very good. Excellent. So now what are some signs and symptoms of caregiver stress and or fatigue that we should look for? And then can you give us some tips on, how, and on ways that we might be able to help caregivers reduce stress and fatigue? Um, okay. Let's talk about the signs. We, you know, looking at a caregiver, you could see if they've had some sleep or not. You could see if their clothes are clean or not. You could see if they, you know, taking a look around the house and seeing what, you know, if you're in a living room or a den, um, you know, you kind of want to be the investigator and you would be able to see. So, Mr. We'll go to Mr. Jones. We'll use him as the example. 
um, you know, are you, you know, are you, how are you doing with the laundry? How are you doing with getting your medications on a timely basis? Like, I think that we've got to really look because they're so wrapped up in taking care of their loved one that they sometimes, they neglect themselves like we talked about and they don't realize how obvious it is. But for you coming with fresh eyes coming into the home, you can see that. So I think the fatigue is written all over their face. And you also can see about their weight. Is their weight a good weight or not a good weight? I think the eyes reveal a lot. I think the the um, I think if their face is sagging, if they look depressed. I mean, you can see that. You're professionals. You know what that looks like. So I think by really, has the gentleman had a haircut? Have they have they shaved? Um, for the wife, it may be, has she been to the beauty parlor? You may want to look at her nails. Does she take care of herself at all? I'm not saying she has to be at the beauty parlor every week, but, you know, are her nails clean? Are they filed? Um, what kind of shoes, what shape are her shoes are in? Like, you kind of want to look at that, um, the very obvious visual cues. Um, so the tips to me would be, before you walk into someone's home, or into someone's setting, you want to clear your mind of everything else but and be in the present. You don't want to be thinking about the phone call that you just had to handle at the office or a personal call that you had to take about your, your child or, or family member. You want to really, or the other client you saw just before this one, you really want to bring yourself into the present and as I, how I would do that is before I ring that doorbell or knock on the door, I would in my car or if there's a place that you're sitting before you go see them, I would close my eyes and I would just bring myself to the present and release everything else that's been going on for that day for you. And that will help you have a much more energized and alert um, way of being with this family. You will be fresh for them. Not like, oh, my God, there's now another person I have to see today. It's, you know what, I am so thrilled that I'm getting to meet this family because I know I'm going to be able to take care of them. I know our services are wonderful, and they've been just waiting for us. If you put on that other hat, this new hat of energized and being alert with the, and can stay connected to your passion of what you do, you will be a home-run home care company because this is what people want. They have been waiting for you all day, and your day has been crazy. But you know what? You need to be really present and calm and centered before you walk in that door, because if you do, you will see those signs of fatigue and be able to address them in a really wonderful and positive way. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to now put into the chat box a um, question, and we'd love to have some of you to respond or all of you respond to the chat question, and it's going to be, how can home health clinicians work better in including caregivers into the care planning and setting goals? And Misty has put that up there now. So go ahead and type in some of your responses, and we'll share some of those as we continue. But because our time is running short, I'm going to jump right into the next question with Kim. So many of our care caregivers may not be present in the home when the nurse or therapist visits. So what are some ideas that we could pos uh, positively engage these caregivers when they're not present during a visit? Um, well, the first one, you know, really is the communication um, because when they're not there, they're worried about not being there. And if we were to think about their their state of mind and wanting our goal to bring them peace of mind and at ease, then we really do need to communicate with them. And it really would be nice. And I've seen this before. There's books that and journals that home care companies leave for the family caregiver to read. And I, I think that's really great. But I think maybe you may want to add some additional detail um, to that, whether um, – because I think – if I'm not a caregiver and I can't be there, I really want to know what was mom's day like? And I don't want just general. I like specific cause so that I can visualize what it was like for her that day. Um, you know, if she, if she took a nap, um, did, she, did she have a restful sleep or was she up a lot? Um, when she watched the movie with you, was she laughing during the movie or crying during the movie? Like, 
people want additional information. So I think the key really is, again, continually building that relationship with the caregiver. And, and communication, whatever way that is, whether it's pictures, whether you cut out, you know, a caregiver, professional caregiver from a company cuts out pictures and puts a scrapbook together, a little, you know, something not professional, but just something that's really cute that shows that, you know what, we really had a great day today. Your mother did really well. That will make the caregiver feel like they've made the right choice and feel less guilty about them not being there themselves. Does that answer your question, Missy? It, it does. And then even from a nursing perspective, too, we're so busy when we are out seeing our patients, but even if it was once a week, especially for those long-distance caregivers, to give an update where we are with, with the disease process and, and sharing what we're teaching the family that they could reinforce. We leave patient tools all the time, but do we tell the caregiver it's there to review it, to, to reinforce it? So there is great opportunities, and I think um, let's also provided a, a comment in our chat that I think ties in nicely. During um, admission, it's essential to obtain the emergency contact information of someone who does not reside with the client and to provide inf additional information about how life was before the patient. So we can learn as healthcare providers from, the, from that interaction, but then it also is developing that trust and relationship um, and a great opportunity that, that you had mentioned before, Kim. I, I, I love what she just said because it, it makes me think, again, even if there's articles that you're reading, send them to the caregiver. They would love to think, oh, my God, after hours, this woman saw an article and she thought of sharing that with me. How kind. So I'm just saying that by learning someone's um, – also by learning how someone's past is, there could be someone else that you know that also was a newspaper reporter or was a nurse in a hospital. It's like, there's so many ways to connect with people, but you have to do your discovery. So again, just the discovery for you know the whole family, but also that discovery for the, the patient or the client that you have, and then helping the caregiver knowing that you're there for them also is very important. So I love what she had to say. Great. And that actually ties in, and we're going to kind of wrap up this section here just to, uh, with this last question here. We're working a lot in reducing admissions or rehospitalizations. It is a national priority. Um, so there are many best practice and evidence-based strategies, home care agencies, hospitals, physician practices can and are using, but our rates are still high. And we really, I think, have not taken advantage of the caregivers to help us in assisting and reducing hospitalization. So um, Misty Dyke, if you'll please put that, uh, pose a question in the chat box, and we'll come back and take a look at some of those responses um, as well. And if anyone has any Q&As uh, for our speakers, we're going to go ahead and post those. We'll address those in just a few minutes. But back to the acute care hospitalization, um, is there anything that you think that we as professional caregivers could help um, caregivers keep patients out of the hospital? Okay. It's, it's a big question. That's a big question. Uh -oh. I know. It's a big question. And it's so, it's so important because that definitely is the trend that's happening now. Um, ask me the question again so I can really think okay. about what you said. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I was trying to. Um, there are many, many best practice pa practices to reduce hospitalizations. So what yes. role do you think the caregivers have in assisting with reducing hospitalization? Okay, all right. I think caregivers don't know how to approach discharge, discharge planners. Um, they don't know necessarily who they are, you know, where they are in the hospital. Um, what services they provide. Like, I think that the discharge planners have really, it's their responsibility to connect with the family member and with the patient. And I just think that now what has happened is that the burden is now shifted to the caregiver or the patient to find and seek that discharge planner or social worker. And it's, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault, it's just, it's a, it's a disconnect. 
And I think it's so important that the caregiver now feel empowered to search them out in the hospital and build that relationship with them the first day or two days that their loved one is in that hospital. Because if you do, they, will, they are your new best friend in that hospital. And they are the ones who can really help guide you to what are the next steps. Or having that conversation, maybe you're not sure. How do you know the difference whether your mom should go home or should go into an assisted living with some additional care, or just go home, or maybe move to your sister's? You just don't know. So I'm saying to you is that caregivers, the message needs to be so clear that they need to feel empowered and have the permission to seek out who is my discharge planner and set up that appointment if you can't find them. Leave them a note under their door. Find a way, have the director of nursing help you. There are resources for you in that hospital who are supposed to guide you on what are the next steps. And they have resources because a lot of home care companies and different um, facilities have come to the, to the discharge planners to be able to tell them the services that they have so they can share that with the family. So again, it's really now the caregiver who is really responsible for getting that done. So right. they've got to be really true. assertive and, you know, get brave, put their brave face on and go and do that because they have to feel connected to that passion that I need to be in charge and be advocating for my loved one, that there's no one else who's going to do it like you. Great. Now I have two quick comments that I'm going to cover before we kind of move into our other speakers, and Kim will come back uh, with some Q&As and ask you for just a closing statement in just a few minutes. Uh, first from Beth, uh, what are, it says to ask the caregivers what their expectations are from home health, because they may totally be wrong on what the, uh, where they're coming from and wh what we're able to provide. Explain what they can expect from you, your agency, Share tentative plan of uh, your plan of care and goals, and ask that to gain their agreement. Provide specific examples on patients' diagnosis and what they should call the home health agency for, and let them know that signs and symptoms that they may experience with caregiver burnout to report. Excellent. And from Leslie. We have that this relates specifically to the plan to involve the caregiver by explaining everything we need to monitor with their assistance, such as weights and ca with calendars, blood glucose charts, BP recordings, um, and, um, and the day that the home health is coming to see the patient. Relate this specifically to the teaching documents that you have uh, noted sorry, that you have notified them that they are in the patient's folder about the specific disease process. And we have a couple more comments, and we'll see if we can get back to those in just a little bit. But Kim, your your comments were just wonderful and, and so directly appropriate for our environment. We will come back with some closing thoughts, but um, I just want to hit this slide. There are three ways to connect with Kim afterwards as well. Um, there's the Caregiving Hour radio show that I mentioned earlier. It's on Mondays and then also on Saturdays at 5. You can also look that up online. It's available to, uh, to listen to the recordings. They're excellent. The Caregiving Resource Helpline is available with the information and phone number, as well as the Caregiver Resource uh, network.com for information, great resources as available too. Now, I'm going to hold the Q&A until we listen to the other two speakers because there was just such great insight from Kim. I didn't want to, um, I do want to go ahead and make sure that I introduce our next two speakers. We have Deb Perrion, um, who works for the Regulatory and Quality Affairs and Clinical Leadership Offices at Bayada Home Health Care in Morristown, New Jersey. She's responsible for the quality improvement activities through the home health practice with Bayada. Her focus is on National Acute Care Hospitalization Readmission Reduction Initiative entitled Safe at Home. She works specifically with HHQI, with our organization, um, with, as being a technical expert panel for our best practice intervention packages as a network coordinator, and she's currently on our stakeholder work group um, as well to advise and to give us counsel. She has been a member of the New York New Jersey Care Integrative Integrations Advisory Board, um, as well as the presenter for, for NOC and the Case Management Society of America. She's certified as a professional 
healthcare quality expert through the Healthcare Quality Certification Commission and has earned her green belt in Six Sigma from Villanova University in Pennsylvania. And Deb, would you like to share some comments of being both a professional caregiver and an actual family caregiver? And Deb, you might be on mute. Thank you. Yes, I was. I am so sorry. Yeah, here I am, yakking away and, and, and nobody there to listen. Okay, so um, so my mom is 97 years old, and she's been with me for the last four years. Uh, it's been a blessing. Uh, formerly, she lived in Florida, and my son lived only a mile away from her, and so I was comfortable with him being with her and, and there for emergencies, uh, but then he moved to the west coast of uh, Florida and we sashayed her um, to, to New Jersey here with us. So I guess when we're talking about challenges, and, and I've been listening intently to, to the things that have been said, and, you know, it is just so difficult to separate myself from the nurse and the daughter. That's been my biggest, biggest challenge. Um, you know, I'm constantly assessing her and diagnosing and, you know, looking at every little nook and cranny um, because I'm afraid that I'm going to miss something, and um, which is where my head was when my father passed away. Um, because, uh, well, let me just tell you briefly, he had a pemphigoid, which is an autoimmune Problem and they had him on high doses of um, steroids. And when he, uh, because of that and his diabetes, they had him on insulin. And when uh, he was in a nursing home, and when they uh, decreased his steroids because the pemphigoid got better, I forgot to make sure that they had lowered his insulin. And the people in the nursing home um, kept giving him his uh, higher dose of insulin, and he became. Um, you know, hypoglycemic where he was unresponsive. So I'm constantly worried that I'm going to miss something with my mother and then that that's going to be, um, you know, the cause of her demise. So, uh, you know, it, it's not easy uh, to be a nurse and to be a caregiver, a full-time caregiver. Um, my husband's also a nurse, and so between us we're really probably over, overly vigilant. Um, looking for symptoms and, and complications. And, yes, that whole piece about taking care of yourself, um, I infrequently exercise. Um, I try to do my best with eating, but um, more importantly, um, I'm always exhausted. Uh, the last time that she was in a hospital, when she came home, uh, she wasn't sleeping through the night, and, and she was trying to get out of bed. And so, um, you know, we got a baby monitor to hear, and you, you, you sleep, you know, with one ear in her room and, and one ear in my, you know, in my room. So um, trying to be rested is really, really hard. And the other challenge is not doing too much for her. Um, for instance, she can take off her clothes, she can lean over and take off her shoes and socks, but it makes her extremely short of breath. And so, you know, I'm just trying to help undress her uh, because I know it's going to be easier on her breathing, but then, you know, she gets upset because she's capable of doing it. So there's that little bit of, of um, struggling. And um, lastly, there's this emotional piece. Uh, this conflict in my head because I'm the youngest of three girls and uh, and I get absolutely no assistance at all from my two older sisters because uh, they say that I'm the nurse and I'm the one that should know what they're you know what should be done so um, it becomes a, a little bit of an emotional problem but I've I've had a lot of lessons that I've learned especially from my dad and one of the things was starting hospice earlier than I did for my father when I realized that, you know, there wasn't really much more time with dad. Um, I got hospice not so much for him but for my mother to help her work through uh, his, his loss, and that was 14 years ago. So now mom's 97, and the hospice is really probably more for me to help me adjust 
um, to the inevitable loss of my mother, um, which is going to be absolutely devastating for me because I've had her with me 24-7 for these last four years. Um, the other thing that I've learned, and I knew it for my father, too, is to try to keep things as light as possible, um, you know, to keep a sense of humor. Because when your caregiver starts saying to you, what's for dinner tonight, and you tell them, and they ask you over and over again every couple of minutes, um, you know, after about the 20th time, it, it it's not unusual that you would want to say, all right, you know, I already told you. But what I usually do in that instance is by the 20th time, I just tell her it's a surprise. Um, so, uh, you know, you really do have to keep your sense of humor the best that you can. Uh, and the other thing that um, that I found extremely helpful, and I know that this won't work for everybody, but uh, we got a little tiny therapy dog, and she's five and a half pounds worth of love. And what not only is she calming for my mom, but she helps both my husband and myself um, stay very, very calm. And and she is with mom all the time. The last time she was hospitalized because she's a therapy dog, she was allowed to stay with her on her bed during the day when we had visiting hours, and um, it, it just was so wonderful, not only for mom, for me and my husband, but the nurses would stop by and, you know, for a couple of seconds, uh, Minnie would would uh, bring a little bit of, of cuteness to everybody, and that, I think, if, if people can get, you know, their hands on a therapy dog for, you know, there's organizations um, to certify, but certainly... Um, you know, if you could find a therapy dog and if your loved one that you're caring for is um, likes animals, uh, whether it's a dog or a cat, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and as far as uh, high points and opportunities, um, you know, talking with my mom is awesome. I'm still fortunate that she does have some memories of her youth and childhood, and I have a video camera actually set up in her bedroom because she's most talkative in the early morning, well, not early morning because she never gets out of bed till about 1.30, uh, but when she first wakes up and before she goes to sleep at night. So, um, so I put the video on, and it'll be something I'm sure that I will treasure for years, and, uh, and that's an awesome thing. And, um, and I like to get her out. I mean, she's on hospice now, so... Um, but she's, you know, we have the uh, electric chairs that take her down the steps and onto her wheelchair, and we take her out as much as we can. So if it's a nice day, she's out on the front porch. Um, if if it's a really beautiful day, we might take her for a little ride, uh, go down the shore for a little bit just to get her fresh air, and uh, and engaging her. And of course, there's never enough time for all the hugs and the kisses. And, and I take full advantage that when I slide her off the bed to stand up to walk to the bathroom with her walker, I'm there, great big hug and a kiss. And, and her hospital bed is big enough that I can actually crawl in next to her. So at night when we say prayers, I'm actually laying next to her. So um, for me, those are the real high points of having my mom here. And I'm going to go pretty fast. Oh, Deb, those are wonderful things, and we thank you for sharing those, and definitely, you know, worth all the effort and all of the issues that you might have, but what wonderful memories you will always carry with you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. Good memories. Good. Okay, well, I know we're going to be running over a little bit, and I apologize for everyone, but I think the information is so wonderful, and with the resource slides, well, I'm not going to worry about those so much, but I'd like to introduce Karen Hinkle. She has spent more than 25 years prior to retiring with the Kentucky Home Health Association in Lexington, Kentucky, including the role of the executive director. Additionally, she's worked in the hospital environment, the Bureau of Health Services, Kentucky Health Systems, and the Department for Health 
Services. Karen has a Master's of Social Work and a Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Kentucky. She serves on the HHQI Stakeholders Work Committee, providing insight and expertise for the campaign. She's had numerous health care committees in Kentucky related to older people, Alzheimer's, as well as state leadership. She has served on various community boards and volunteers in her community. So, Karen, would you like to share with us as well? I'd be delighted to. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Um, my caregiving experience uh, it covers about uh, now, I guess, 15, 16 years. First, my mother, uh, over a total of about six or seven years, uh, she was in her home, so it was a long-distance caregiving, and then eventually moved to where she lived with my husband and I for two and a half years, uh, or uh, three and a half years, rather, uh, before her death, and she was a, a total invalid at the end of that and had medical issues as well as dementia. Then uh, I have been a confident, uh, advisor, helper, uh, and stand-in at times for my brother, who uh, whose wife had a, a severe stroke at age 54, and he's been the 24-7 caregiver for the last six years. And um, I've tried to, to give the advice and, and uh, consult primarily for him with understanding all the array of the sources that he may or may not be eligible for. And then the, the most recent is with my 87-year-old uh, father-in-law, who uh, is still living in his own home that has serious vision issues and some other medical problems, and he has lived with us for short periods after surgery and after uh, a broken hip. So I've, I've sort of gone the range. I think the couple of key things I'd like to emphasize, and, and I think Deb uh, made some important points as well as Kim, is that you know the caregiving array of, of involvement can vary from as simple as doing grocery shopping and maybe paying bills at the beginning to moving to being full-fledged, uh, providing the total care, uh, all the ADLs and, and medical care and managing it all. Um, and, and in my experience, the caregiver has to be uh, an organizer extraordinaire. Um, they end up being financial manager uh, in many cases and dealing with property and bills. And it's complicated if they're with you and there's still another home and, and taking care of that. Uh, they negotiate and arbitrate between family members, between caregivers, between agencies involved in the care. Uh, there are medical advocates, um, and emphasizing more and more, I think, uh, a little bit more, is that so important for the caregiver to um, learn the lingo, to know the rules of coverage, to follow um, uh, what's going on and what's covered and who, who, who can do what, and to learn that role of, of giving care and asking lots of questions. And I think if agencies can do anything to help is to make sure that the caregivers know and understand. And and if they know and understand the signs and symptoms, the things to watch for, then they can often, not out of panic, uh, consult the agency rather than say call 911 or take someone to the hospital. So I think there's a big role there. Um, and, and general care coordinator is a, is a primary function. and um, an article in, in the region AARP journal from um, the spouse of, of uh, Muhammad Ali was noting how having everything written and planned and, and organized, and maybe it's my, one of my characteristics primarily, but um, write it down, write it down, write it down. Uh, we prepared um, file, uh, a bulletin board with key uh, numbers, resource numbers, family members, uh, her DNR order and all that were in her bedroom, so it was available for my father. Um, and while it was, it, getting his phone numbers and key uh, people and, and appointments in large type posted on his refrigerator so he could see them and thinking creatively how to keep it down. But we also uh, maintained a logbook. And whether it was family members or whether it was a paid caregiver, um, the, the non medical aides that we had at times. We ask everyone if, during their stint to write down what happened. So we have a record of both physical, her, her emotional state, her mental state, how she ate. Those, those notebooks became invaluable for helping us to tell the, the nurses or the therapists when they came in what they might need to know to be able to convey to the physician if things had changed. 
and just to know over time how things changed. And actually, after my mother's demise, those books were a great source of comfort because I could read over certain things that had happened because we recorded the funny things as well as, as the, the the medical things. Um, the uh, the one thing I learned, and, and agencies might not want to hear this, but as, as wonderful as caregivers are from agencies, you're one of many that they're serving. And they're often there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe a bit longer. And the caregivers, if they're involved, are involved 24-7, day after day after day after day after day. So you can't expect that an agency personnel is going to have your back. They may in many ways, but I think you have to be as caregiver, as prepared and knowledgeable um, as you as you can be uh, because the agencies may help you with identifying potential other resources, um, but you're going to be the one who's going to have to follow up with them. The fact that someone says, I sent a referral to this and such agency or this document was sent to them doesn't mean the person who needs it gets it. And so you have to be willing to be uh, a strong advocate and to make those follow-up calls and make sure you get everything you need because not only do you need the health care that the agency, the home health or hospice are doing, but you need perhaps help with meals. You need some help with maybe prescriptions. You need um, homemaking help that may be there available. You need to deal and know the regulations for the non-medical care and where you can get those. Uh, who's going to handle those things? Um, you know, clarifying in terms of, of certain specialized equipment. And and I learned too that in dealing with the non-medical caregivers that we had to have, because during my mom's time I was working full time, is that you have to also be educator and trainer because even though they're prepared for the basics, you've got to prepare them to know the specifics about your care receivers needs, uh, idiosyncrasies, if they have vision issues, if they have dietary issues. Uh, so I prepared, you know, a training sheet and knew that I would have to spend the first half an hour with anyone coming in to relieve us so that we could go out for dinner or go to a family event, that I had to go through all of that with them so they were comfortable and I was comfortable. Now, in every case, you might not have to, but my mother at the end was, you know, legally blind, uh, deaf in one ear and, and totally incapacitated. The only thing she could really do was feed herself. So I had to make sure that everything was covered. Um, you know, fortunately I think that helped them feel more comfortable and they knew immediately who to call if they needed to and what was happening. And I know uh, the agencies that we worked with said we took kept better records than sometimes they did because of the detail. But that was the only way I could do it and be comfortable. Um, the other was the flexibility, uh, even though you may have rigid schedules, maintaining some flexibility and that sense of humor can't be forgotten. And calling on friends and you know family and preparing them so they can relieve you for that short while and taking advantage of those. And, and I was fortunate to have wonderful friends who would come and spend two, two or three hours and that was a blessing. And with all of that help and all of that organization, I have to say that the caregiving was truly a gift I could give to my family member, and I wouldn't have changed a thing. But the stress that you go through is very real. A uh, 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 year after my mother died, I was diagnosed with a uh, metastatic tumor in my lung that was, uh, I think the doctors all agreed it was 11 years after another diagnosis and that it was the, the five or six years of, of extreme stress that did that. And it wasn't that I didn't take care of myself, but it's a stressful situation. So I think everyone does need to, to be aware of that, to make sure they uh, do as much as they can to take care of themselves and to relieve that stress and hand it off to someone else when they can do so. Oh, thank you, Karen. Those are such great points and things that we can do for our, for not only ourselves and other family members, but also for the, to the caregivers. And, and I think coming back to a statement Kim said, we need to ask how they're doing and have you been to the doctor recently and, and check in on their health status. So thank you both, De Deb and Karen. Excellent 
uh, presentations, and I'm sure many of you that are on the call today could also relate very similar situations or stories that of, uh, of great success and, and things that you would never change, but also lessons learned. And we learn from one parent to another. You heard both from Deb and Karen, you know, taking the, what we learn and, and, and adding that to what we do next. And we can also add it to the professional, what we do as a professional caregiver. We can take all of that and look forward and using that information. Now, I know we're over and we're going to kind of wrap up here, but I want to come back to our wonderful patient speaker, Kim, who I kind of had to cut off. So I just want to come back and ask for just any a closing remark um, from her. Um, Kim, are you still there with us? Yeah, are you on? There story. you go. There you go. And I just wanted to thank everyone, and again, Misty, for giving me this opportunity. And really, it's just being mindful of what we're doing as caregivers and professional caregivers, and just really trying to be compassionate to ourselves as we are to each other, and giving ourselves permission to to really do to take some breaks when we need it. Um, to have some fun when we can, and, and to still enjoy this caregiver journey. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to just quickly show some resources. They are on your handouts, and Misty did put a link for that, um, that are available. We do have a consumer resource site. Here's a great tool for questions for the visit. Several of our speakers talked about that. Simple tool to use. Um, here's a patient self-management risk assessment to see if they're at risk for being in the hospital, but we can have caregivers be involved and understand why we're trying to reduce the hospital risk. There's a My Emergency Plan. It's a great way to use signs and symptoms that will tell caregivers. If there are caregivers that are out of state, we could email the, the um, document to them. It's, it's just a, a pure, simple document, and then talk through what we want them to call about. Um, there's a caregiver assessment questionnaire that comes through the American Medical Association. That's an excellent tool. The, where you can download it is included on the slides. Um, I, again, two resources that come from Kim with the Caregiving Resource Helpline, as well as the Caregiver Hour. Great resources we could give our caregivers and um, provide them a place for them to get some help. Um, and there's some great caregiver websites. These are some really good evidence-based best practice type sites that are available with their links. Over two slides. Our next up call will be in July. We will only do one during the, the summer months, so July 9th, and it's on population health management for, from the home health perspective. And Sharon Fisher, who did uh, work with the Blue Cross and Blue Shield and a home care agency, is going to be sharing some of their successes. Uh, we have live chat. You're always welcome to ask questions. There's no audio. You just come on. There's a link that you can sign up for a reminder. It's July 20th. You can always connect with us. We do have an evaluation at the end. We really do value, and we look at all of the feedback. The recording will be up tomorrow um, by noon for you to share with anyone else. And we really want to thank you for your time and for your extra time today for this wonderful topic. And I, my heart just goes out to each of our speakers today in sharing their, their stories and their expertise um, that hopefully has enlightened each of us as professional caregivers. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.